J. Mays spent his 34 years in the automotive industry reminding everyone why they fell in love with cars. He was at the forefront of the retro craze that dominated the late 90s and 2000s. Some of the most prominent cars of this nature, such as the fifth generation Ford Mustang and the concept that inspired the Volkswagen Beetle, were designed under his watch. Nearly a decade after his retirement, the movement still resonates with automakers and consumers alike. Welcome to another episode of Industry Icons. Jay Mays was born in Pauls Valley, Oklahoma in 1954, but grew up in nearby Maysville. The small town in the heart of the state has a population of just over 1,000 people. Many car designers become inspired to pursue that profession due in large part to their environment and the people around them, and Mays' situation was no different. A 1996 article from The Oklahoman revealed how deep the obsession with cars ran in this family. Jay's grandfather served on pit crews on the Indianapolis 500, and his great-grandfather was an amateur open-wheel racer. His dad also raced, though his career was cut short due to injury. These early years also instilled in him the importance of precision and accuracy. His family ran a cattle ranch, and the young Jay did whatever he could to help out. He often found himself plowing the fields. Jay challenged himself to complete the task as accurately and meticulously as possible. The Mays also ran an auto parts store to supplement their income. Most people find merchandise facing and shelf dusting especially dull, but Jay took great pleasure in organizing the stock. You can probably imagine how this upbringing influenced him artistically. He described himself as a child who preferred to color inside the lines. Jay's path to the automotive industry seemed rather straightforward. Perhaps he could have gone to a state university to study general design or attended one of a handful of schools in the country that specialized in car styling. He didn't take either of these paths, at least to start. Jay didn't even know that the profession existed. He enrolled at the University of Oklahoma after graduating from high school and majored in commercial art. The subject matter didn't take with him though, so he dropped out of the program and switched over to a journalism track. Pursuing a career in that field appeared to be a bit of a departure for the lifelong artist. He decided to make the jump largely because a friend of his owned a newspaper in town. Unfortunately, Jay was out of his element in this environment as well and struggled to find his footing. Just as he was at his wit's end, he learned about Art Center College of Design in Southern California. Its transportation design program in particular intrigued him. He couldn't believe that people made a living drawing cars. Sketching aside notebooks is just a small part of the job, though the mere prospect was enough to get Jay interested. He worked in his portfolio during a summer break and sent it to Art Center. The school accepted it, and Jay was set on a new career path. The dream was further realized thanks to a sponsorship from Ford. Deals like this sometimes require the student to commit to the automaker upon graduation, though that stipulation didn't appear to be part of this arrangement. His final project attracted no fewer than nine job offers. Instead of going to a large, well-established automaker, Jay Mays joined a scrappy underdog in Audi. He figured that he would have a better shot at having one of his designs produced since it was a smaller company at the time. He began working for the company in 1980 and moved halfway across the world to Ingolstadt, Germany. Hopping from a small southern town to one of the largest cities in the world and then to Europe would probably leave most people in a state of perpetual culture shock. Jay Mays wasn't as out of his element as you might think. The meticulous way in which German automakers operated was in line with his personality. Hartmut Workers, Audi's chief of design at the time, also did quite a bit to acclimate him to the company culture. In the book Retro Futurism, the car design of Jay Mays, he said, Warkus was my true teacher on the design side. Where I learned how to design a car was under his stewardship, not at Art Center. Art Center gave me the ability to draw and gave me the ability to execute and have my designs on a wall. But Warkus taught me how to think about design, which was very German in the sense as well. Jay seemed to be correct in believing there was room for him to grow at Audi. Within a few years of coming aboard, he was appointed as the lead designer of the B3 Audi 80 under Warkus. 
It is a departure from the wedge-shaped Jujaro Special that it was set to replace. The B3 takes on a softer design language and becomes more playful and inviting as a result. It also does a few interesting things with its greenhouse. The reduced A and C pillars do a lot to open the cabin up. Additionally, designers removed the kink in the rear quarter light and introduced a graceful curve onto the back window. From certain angles, it appears to wrap around to the other end. The B3 also makes use of flush door handles that contribute to a more aerodynamic look. A more subdued character line passes through them and meets with the corner of the back lights. The B3 was a radical evolution of Audi's design language. Judging from a poll I ran some time ago, it seemed to be a change for the better. It won in a landslide, garnering 74% of the total votes. After spending three years at Audi, Jay Mays moved down the road to Munich and worked for BMW. In this brief stint, he contributed to the designs of the E34 5 Series and E31 8 Series. Jay returned to Audi in 1984, this time serving as a senior designer that emphasized aerodynamic research. Models that he influenced include the Audi 100, Volkswagen Polo, and Audi Quattro. His most noteworthy project from this period had yet to come though. Audi made a splash at the 1991 Tokyo Motor Show when it unveiled the Avis Quattro concept. This polished aluminum wonder was a love letter to Auto Union's pre-war race cars. This was the first time that Jamie's integrated the company's heritage into a project's design to this extent. It differs from later cars in this vein in the sense that it echoes a point in time rather than a particular model. The manner in which the haunches flare up past the hood and rear deck evokes memories of the streamlined Auto Union V16 Type-C streamline. While the execution isn't quite as pronounced on the Avis, the arches still emphasize the wheels and make the car feel lower to the ground in comparison. The Avis Quattro has striking proportions and a dramatic shape, but the aluminum bodywork stands out as its most distinguishing element. Craftsmen worked the material into shape by hand much like how a constructor would have done it in the 1930s. Audi's decision to leave the exterior unpainted pays off in a few key ways. It is perhaps the most obvious callback to the Auto Union days. The harsh reflections also accentuate its curvaceous styling. Most importantly, it makes the car feel substantial. Even through photographs, observers can get a sense of its volume as well as the richness of the aluminum. It's almost as if it were carved from a single block of metal. Designers emphasized the material even further through their treatment of various exterior elements. Side mirrors are typically affixed to the main body. On the Avis, they're placed directly on the A-pillar. This cleans up that area of the car and gives it a more aerodynamic appearance. Mirrors on Auto Union race cars were similar in the sense that they were integrated into the bodywork rather than being attached by stocks. The vent on the lower half of the body also mimics the appearance of the ones found on those cars. While these call a bit of attention to themselves, the intakes just ahead of the rear wheels are a bit more covert. They cut deep into the body, but don't distract from the aluminum sheet metal due to their placement atop the shoulder. From certain angles, you wouldn't even know they were there. From a bird's eye view, we can see how the car's smattering of lines and curves are related. The aforementioned intakes are unified through the base of the rear screen. The prominent haunches at the front also flow seamlessly into the rails, though this is cut short as it meets the most important through line. A teardrop motif wraps around the car's greenhouse before coming into its zone at the deck. This is a nod to the bullet-shaped competition machines of yesteryear. Much like those thoroughbreds, the Avis appears to slice through the wind even when it's standing still. Instead of coming to a defined point like its forebearers, the teardrop comes to an abrupt stop as it meets the quarter panel. Cutting the tail off in this manner does look a bit odd, though it is typically more aerodynamically beneficial to end these early rather than to have them continue. I bet you've already noticed the massive Naka duct in the roof. Audi engineers certainly had function over form when they were fleshing this element out. It comes out of nowhere and interrupts what would have been a continuous expanse of glass. On the flip side, it doesn't take away that much since it isn't placed in the body. I'd also imagine that it would do the bulk of the engine cooling. Without it, designers would likely have to saddle the exterior with the extra vents to make up that lost ground and compromise on their vision. Speaking of which, 
the car used a mid-mounted 6-liter W12 that produced 509 horsepower, or at least that was the plan. Audi still hadn't wrapped up development on that powertrain, so the car on the auto show floor used a rather convincing stand-in made from plastic and wood. While the engine would be produced in mass starting in 2001, the Avis Quattro remained a concept. It received a warm reception though, and Jay expanded upon the principles established here in the years that followed. He'd be in a prime position to do just that. In 1990, an entire year before the Avis Quattro debuted, the company appointed him as chief designer of a newly opened Volkswagen Audi design studio in Simi Valley, California. Volkswagen's American operations had been in the state of decline for two decades. It sold roughly 600,000 vehicles in the market in 1970. In 1990, the company only mustered 150,000 sales. An exit from the US was not out of the question, but Wolfsburg's pride and joy wasn't going to go down without a fight. It placed a renewed emphasis on the country, reinforcing its presence on the west coast by far its surest foothold in the market, was a critical part of the equation. This is where Jay came into the picture. Volkswagen felt that his experience in the region made him the perfect candidate to head up operations here. It originally taxed him with defining California trends, though rather than peering ahead of the future, Jay looked into the past. He took his experience with the Avis Quattro concept into account and decided to weave design and heritage together once again. This time, he wanted to mirror these concepts with an increased priority on branding, advertising, and marketing. The book Retro Futurism states that designers typically didn't involve themselves with factors that weren't squarely in the realm of styling back then. These areas were handled separately by other departments, though Jay felt that it would be beneficial to integrate these processes. The Beetle was arguably Volkswagen's most iconic model. Jay chose this as a base for his new project. Adapting its design to present-day regulations would have been a fool's errand, while lazily applying retro cues to a new car would have led to disastrous results. No, he intended to create a fully reimagined bug for the modern era. Before ever putting pen to paper, the team surveyed customers to find out what they liked about Volkswagen and the Beetle. Its honesty, reliability, and simplicity stood out to them the most. Jay honed in on that last descriptor. He made a graph that was labeled simple on one end and complex on the other. In the middle were various other terms. After correlating numerous geometric forms to the words, he found that the shape of a circle was most strongly associated with simplicity. Jay detailed his philosophy, saying, Nothing is more simple to understand than a circle. It embodies a soft, childlike quality, which I think explains people's almost motherly reaction to the car. The shape was heavily incorporated into the new car, which earned the name Concept One. The circular badge? Headlights, side mirrors, and fog lights all made for a friendly and recognizable front-end signature. Even elements that weren't completely circular, such as the hood shut line and lower clip, played into the motif. Jay and his team put together one hell of a proposal, but convincing the corporate suits to go through with it was a battle unto itself. They believed that the Beetle had its time on the sun and wanted to move on. German execs also believed that there were still negative connotations attached to it and were hesitant to resurface them. Americans saw the car in a different light though. It remained an icon in that market years after Volkswagen stopped sales in 1979. Simi Valley still faced an uphill battle in this regard. The design team worked up a presentation that illustrated the impact the model had on this market. It detailed the Beatles' American introduction, rise to prominence, cultural resonance, and eventual downfall. Except, in a way, it was as relevant as ever. Favorable weather conditions in places like Southern California helped keep the cars on the road and allowed bug culture to flourish. They capped things off by showing the higher-ups the Concept One model. The pitch worked like a charm. It broke cover in Detroit in 94 inspired the new Beetle in 97, and helped steer Volkswagen in the right direction in the US. 
Jay spent some time working for Audi in Germany before relocating to Southern California once again. He took a break from car design studios and found employment at SHR Perceptual Management, a brand identity and development firm. This seemed to be a perfect fit for Jay, who already had an interest in those areas. The company had several automakers in its Rolodex, including Ford. Jay occasionally spoke with Jack Telnak, then the company's chief of design, about various projects. So when he called SHR up one day, he didn't think anything more of it. Jay asked what he could do for him. He responded, I hope I could do something for you. Jack kept the reason for his call close to his chest, but assured Jay that he'd elaborate over lunch in Detroit. He flew out to the Motor City to meet with a designer, but found that there was a third guest present. Jock Nasser, Ford's president at the time. They shot the breeze about car design and the automotive industry as a whole. While it was nice to catch up with him, Jay couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this. He'd already come to his own conclusion. Several high-ranking directors under Telnek had retired, and he thought they were preparing to offer him one of those positions. He had no plans of leaving SHR, so if it did come to that, then he planned on turning them down. Late into their meeting, Nasser turned to Telnak and said, Well, I suppose we can tell him now. It's Jack's job we need to fill. This changed everything. Only a few of these positions existed in the US, and just a handful more across the globe. Jay didn't have to think twice about it. On October 1st, 1997, he officially became the company's new chief of design. Jay had been in leadership positions before, but this wasn't like anything he'd encountered up to that point. He supervised a group of 200 employees while at Audi. In his new role, he'd be overseeing 1,000 designers across eight studios dotted around the world. And he wouldn't just be shaping the look of Ford either. Lincoln and Mercury were in the fold, and due to the company's recent buying spree, he'd be managing the efforts of Mazda, Volvo, Land Rover, Jaguar, and Aston Martin. How could one person possibly give each brand and every employee the proper attention? To start, each mark had its own director who could be more involved with day-to-day -day concerns in the studio. Jay also gave the more established studios greater autonomy and only got hands-on with the facilities that needed extra attention. Jaguar and Volvo, for instance, already had strong design operations and could go on with little interference from him. Ford's American and European studios weren't as developed and thus received significantly more of its time. It was unusual for someone in his position to be that involved in the process, but he hoped to set an example that other employees could follow. Ford also streamlined its product development cycle under his watch. This was an area that Jay believed the company could stand to improve. He said, We would spend three quarters of our time just plastering the walls with ideas. Then we would say, We're out of time. We've got to execute this thing. So the execution would be substandard compared with what you saw coming out of Germany. Instead of spinning their wheels in the conceptualization phase and limping across the finish line, design teams would now commit to a direction early on and spend the rest of their time refining it. Jay said that this was similar to what occurred in Germany. Audi typically focused on two proposals and then made its choice about a fourth of the way through. Ford is among the most storied automakers in the entire industry and would therefore serve as the perfect candidate for Jay's design philosophy. The first major project in this vein was the Ford Thunderbird, which debuted as a concept in 1999. Like the Concept 1, it attempted to bring the essence of the original into a new era. Unfortunately, it leaves quite a bit to be desired in this regard. The new car was longer in both wheelbase and overall length. Some amount of bloat was expected considering the difference in taste and safety regs in the near half century separating the two cars. Still, the new Thunderbird doesn't hide the extra sheet metal very well. The cabin is pulled far forward on the body, which shortens the hood and makes the passenger compartment and rear deck appear even longer in comparison. It seems to belie its rear drive architecture. The proportions are a far cry from the first generation T-Bird. On that car, the cabin is pushed further back. The third box is still rather long, but the vehicle still looks balanced, lean, and focused. 
while it wasn't an all-out sports car, it at least looked like it had sporting pretensions. Some of the finer details also disappoint. The grille, for instance, lies nearly flush with the body. It looks like an extension of the body rather than its own element. The filled-in bits on the upper corners of the grille cheapen the car's centerpiece even further. Cars often have non-functional openings in their grilles. While most make some effort to obscure this fact, the Thunderbird leaves them completely exposed for the world to see. The 1999 concept is pretty close to the production model, though this is one area where they diverge. It's a little detail, but the show car looks more upscale for it. Lastly, the fog lights jutting into the grill are meant to reference the Dagmars from the original model. There is no way they could have gotten those past federal regulations. Once again, the execution lets the car down. They weaken the grill and create some odd surface areas. This undated sketch is an indication of what could have been. It's more in line with the original in both proportions and detailing. The grill is wider, flanked by a set of fog lights, and inset into the body. It also seems to keep the overhangs and wheelbase in check. Renderings of this sort are mere representations of ideas and are often far removed from reality. Still, one has to wonder how the production car strayed so far from this. The interior is even worse off. Aside from a throwback instrument cluster and the T-Bird on the steering wheel, there isn't very much distinguishing it from the Lincoln LS that it's based on. Some versions experiment with the colors and materials, though this does little to liven the cockpit up. For a product that is intended to bring its owner to a certain point in time and fill them with a sense of nostalgia, it undermines the entire point of the car. While its early reception was rather positive, the new Thunderbird failed to live up to the sky-high expectations that Ford had set for it. Only about 54,000 examples found buyers from its introduction in 2001 to its discontinuation in 2005, a mark far short of the projected 25,000 annual sales figure. Jay May said they were careful to not make a caricature of a classic car, but in my eyes, that's exactly what ended up happening. The Ford 49 concept saw the light of day in 2001. It was a product of the Living Legend Studio, a facility that opened the year prior that specialized in creating products inspired by the brand's historic models. As the name implies, the Chip Foose designed show car draws inspiration from the fabled 1949 Ford. Whereas the Thunderbird brought elements over for the sake of having them, the 49 left one critical feature on the cutting room floor. The bullet-shaped central guard and grill bump have been done away with. If someone wasn't already aware of the connection between the two cars, then they might have trouble linking the two. Although the affiliation between them is shaky, the 49 concept still manages to stand on its own legs. The original model was very much a vertically focused design with the aforementioned grill details as well as the hood emblem. The concept, meanwhile, used its width to its advantage. The same is true for the back. The old car's fins have been seriously beefed up and the lights have been integrated into the character line. The 49 also lacks the ornamentation of its namesake. The chrome bumpers at the front and rear as well as the strake on the side are absent. It gets the point across with bright work that lines the window as well as eye-catching wheels. A convertible debuted in 2002, but the 49 project would get no further than this. The Living Legend Studio collaborated with Fort Design California in Valencia on the company's most well-known retro-inspired project. Jay's new streamlined development process was on full display here. On the first day, a designer suggested they carry out a research study to figure out what to build. Jay shut him down, saying, No studies. If we don't know what a Mustang is, we should be working somewhere else. According to studio chief Doug Kafka, the basic design was formed in three days. The small team then spent an entire year refining it. The 2003 Detroit Auto Show featured the Cadillac 16, Aston Martin AMV8, and a Rolls-Royce Phantom. Ford put everyone on notice when it unveiled the Mustang GT Coupe and convertible concepts. The lines are crisp and confident, yet there's a certain softness to the surfacing that keeps the car feeling warm and approachable. It is a bit closed up on the profile view though, the large wheels, low roof, thick A-pillars, and high belt line make it feel bulky and a touch cumbersome. From other angles, the darkened roof comes into play and opens the cabin up. 
The hood vents, side intake, and wide wheel arches are not so subtle hint of the car's power and rear drive architecture. The rear takes heavy inspiration from that of the Shelby Mustangs, with large rectangular taillights flanking a raised roundel. A year later, the production model was shown to the public. While the basic overall look made it through, it has been watered down considerably. It lacks a lot of the depth and muscle that the Concept had on its front end, instead opting for a flatter, more static execution. The hood, for instance, isn't as sculpted and also does without the distinctive intakes. Under the headlights lie another change. The round housings that contain the turn indicators and auxiliary lights have been replaced by large, horizontal signals. I feel this change is to the detriment of the design. They stick out, especially when the car sports more neutral tones. Little was done to integrate them into the theme. The 2007 Shelby GT500 sticks a bit closer to the concept, with angled grille edges and round lights near the bottom of the fascia. The horizontal lights remain, though the company wasn't likely to tool up for new components just for this model. The profile has opened up a bit more thanks to a lower belt line and the inclusion of a small quarter window in place of the louver. On the body, the side intake has been replaced with a line that somewhat mimics that same gesture. The rear diverges significantly from the show car. Its lights are narrower and sit more in line with the body. They more strongly resemble units from non-Shelby Mustangs of yore. Its exhaust tips have been de-emphasized as they're set lower on the quarter panel and set apart from the body. Lastly, while the wings are still present, they pale in comparison to the defined shoulders of the concept. All in all, the 2005 Mustang is a decent enough effort that set the foundation for the next generation of Ford performance. Let's go back to show cars for a moment. The 427 concept debuted in 2003 and was a throwback to the large, powerful sedans of yesteryear. It certainly takes an edge from those cars, but just like the Mustang and Thunderbird before it, the lines have a certain roundness to them. The sharp lines that are present, such as on the upper corners of the headlights and inserts of the grille, stand out. Powering the show car was a 427 cubic inch V8 engine that made a whopping 590 horsepower and 509 pound-foot of torque. It never reached production, but its front-end design would grace an entire generation of Fords. 2004 saw the debut of the Ford Shelby Cobra concept. It used the same formula as the original, a massive engine shoehorned into a compact roadster body. This is taken to 11 here. The Cobra concept used a 605 horsepower V10 and a footprint that was about the same size as the Audi TT of the day. At about 3,000 pounds, the car provides a raw and focused driving experience. It doesn't have air conditioning, cup holders, or radio, or side windows. It doesn't even have exterior door handles. Engineers made extensive use of Ford GT running gear, including its suspension and transmission. A production run didn't seem like it was out of the question since the mechanicals were readily available, but tragically, it remained a concept. In August of the same year, Ford unveiled the Shelby GR1 at Pebble Beach. George Saradakis pinned the machine and Jay Mays requested a clay mock-up once he laid eyes on it. According to a 2015 Road and Track article, only three sketches in total were produced before the transition to three dimensions. This car took its inspiration from the Shelby Daytona Coupe. Both of them have striking proportions, with long hoods, low cabins, and dramatic cam-back tails. The rear wheel haunches, major design elements on the 64 model, were exaggerated even further on the concept. The sheet metal drapes over its shoulders and delineates the wheels. The rear has also been modernized. Before, it culminated in a circular feature that was inset into the body somewhat. On the GR1, this area is defined by the character line. Production may have been in the back of Ford's mind for the GR1. In referring to the car, VP of product creation Phil Martin said that it just might make a worthy competitor to a car like the 575M. It was not meant to be. According to a 2023 Haggerty article, the automaker performed a feasibility study and found that major adjustments would have to be made to get the car production ready. It had to get taller and longer, which would have put the design in jeopardy. Curb weight also had to come down to meet Ford's 3,500 pound target. This would have been a challenge considering it was closer to 3,900 pounds. To make up for some of the difference, 
They contemplated replacing the V10 with an 8-cylinder engine. What really shut the door at the prospect was the GT's steep decline in sales. Ford originally planned to build 4,500 of them, but only managed to move a bit over 4,000. The company thought that the same fate was in store for the GR1, so the endeavor was shelved. Critics of Jamie's often derided his work for being too reliant on the past. He did acknowledge that Heritage played a substantial role in his design philosophy, but shied away from using the retro label, reasoning that it implied that the company didn't take future trends into account as well. He argued that, in some ways, it is more difficult to design a new car that references an older model than it is to start with a blank sheet of paper. It takes years to see a project through to production, and designers had to predict what the market would look like while tastefully incorporating those historic cues. Ford's foray into retro futurism had a fair number of peaks and a few valleys. The GT was far and away the most successful model of the sort in terms of design, though the Mustang was also a critical product for the brand. Although it didn't have the same impact as the concept, the S197 modernized the classic Mustang ethos and made the nameplate relevant to a wide audience once again. For as many heritage-inspired concept cars that graced the auto show floor, only these three cars reached production. Not all of them were going to be viable candidates, but most of Ford's lineup was still sporting the new edge design language. I feel that a sedan in the vein of the 49 and 427 could have tied the mainstream offerings to the Halo cars and elevated the range as a whole. Jay also had a hand in some forward-thinking concepts. The O21C was designed in collaboration with famed industrial designer Mark Newson. It's always a pleasure to see how designers who aren't specifically trained in this field approach car styling, and this one does not disappoint. The name comes from its exterior color, which is orange O21C in the Pantone color catalog. Rounded, organic shapes are prioritized here. The stubby overhangs and light signatures are evidence of this. The detailing in the glass plays into this as well. Take note of the rounded window forms, as well as how the front and rear screens curve onto the profile. A trio of metallic caps gives the C a bit of structure. The one in the back calls attention to a rather unusual storage compartment. Instead of popping upwards like a typical boot, the car utilizes a sliding door that opens like a drawer. Coachwork doors and a swiveling driver's seat aid in the entry and exit of the car. The interior is chock full of references to nuisance products. His Sigma hook wall hanger inspired the look of the steering wheel, while the seats appear to be a precursor to the Nimrod chair, which he designed in 2002. All of the instruments were located in the center of the dashboard. The speedometer occupies its own dial, while all of the other gauges are crammed together in a housing that strongly resembles a chronograph watch complication. More specifically, it echoes the design of the Hemipod watch that he did for Ikepod a year earlier. The car debuted at the Tokyo Motor Show in January of 2000. The following April, it was shown at a furniture fair in Milan, wearing bright green paint. It received a mixed reception initially. Traditional automotive journalists were a bit cold to it because of how it diverged from standard practices. Critics from other realms of design typically saw it through a different lens and could at least appreciate what it was setting out to do. The 24-7 concepts looked to the future in terms of technology. They were developed in collaboration with Visteon, an automotive technology supplier. And yes, there were several variants. The wagon adapted to the needs of families. The pickup was intended for rural buyers. And the coupe was at home in urban environments. All of them shared styling cues, as well as a focus on connectivity and technology. They featured in-vehicle internet browsers that worked with the voice control system to relay information to the occupants. Large screens took the place of a traditional IP. These hinted at the proliferation of touchscreen interfaces in modern cars. Jay Mays retired from Ford in January of 2014, and Moray Callum assumed the role of VP of Design. Interestingly, Jay agreed that he wouldn't work for other automakers. He was far from calling it quits, though. In 2015, he became a visiting professor at the Royal College of Art in London. Whirlpool also appointed him as its chief design officer, a position he held until 2021. And he helped create the cars in Pixar's Zootopia. 
Jay Mays turned an unlikely entrance into the world of car design into a long and exciting career. He helped an entire generation of buyers reconnect with the automobile and is definitely an industry icon.